to another TechMinds video. So I recently managed to fry one of my 100 watt dummy loads. You may have seen these for sale on places like Amazon and eBay. Now I've used this for ages without any issues, mainly being used for testing low power handheld devices on two meters and 70 centimeter handbands with no more than five to 10 watts. Now, if you've been following my channel, you would have noticed I have recently created projects that work in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Well, soon after performing some low power 2.4 gigahertz tests, it appeared that this dummy load stopped working. And when I say stopped working, I mean it became open circuit. Now, this is when I realized that the specification for this dummy load was only up to one gigahertz. So looks like I fried it when squirting 2.4 gigs into it even though it was low power. So I've set out to make my own dummy load using a 50 ohm 100 watt resistor. Now I've seen a few others make something similar, so I wanted to have a go. So I ordered these 50 ohm 100 watt RF resistors from Amazon and they're rated from DC to six gigahertz, or are they? What I will do is mount the resistor on the inside of a little aluminium box. Now you might think that this is rather large box for what I need, and you're probably right. However, these little resistors can get very hot. So the more metal there is, the more heat is dissipated and helps to keep the resistor running efficiently. Now I will also mount a heat sink on the top just to add even more heat dissipation. So first I'm gonna mark out a couple of holes. Now it doesn't really matter where they are, just as long as the spacing is correct, so I can get the nuts and bolts through the box and through the resistor mounting holes. I only said that for those that noticed that I didn't make it straight. As I will also mount a heatsink on top, I'll quickly countersink the holes so that the top of the bolts fit nice and flush to the top of the box. That means the heatsink will fit flushly to the top. Before installing, I wanted to check the impedance of the resistor just to make sure they are actually 50 ohm and not some clones or out of spec product. 49.9 ohms is close enough and should, in theory, provide a good match. Now here I've used a little thermal paste, the same paste which I use for mounting heat sinks onto computer CPUs. I'll carefully put the resistor in place over the pre-drilled holes and then feed through the bolts. Pop the washers on and the nuts and then carefully tighten them up. So now it's time to fit the connector on the side of the box. Notice here that I'm using an SO239 socket. However, later in the video, I changed this to an N-type socket, which is more suited for the higher frequencies. Thanks, Martin and Mike, you know who you are. I'm going to use an M3 tap drill bit here so that I can screw in the bolts into the aluminium, providing a nicer fit. So now it's time to change out that dirty old SO239 and install an N-type. That's better, and I'm sure it will get the approval of BATC. Now once the resistor and the socket is in place, there is one last step to make, and that's the connecting wire between the resistor and the center pin of the socket. Now here I'm using quite thick wire, something which I actually changed to something smaller later on. The little lug of the resistor is extremely fragile, and it's a good job that I ordered 10 of them as when attaching the wire, they can break off, especially if you use oversized stiff wire. Now I've also placed a little insulation tape below where the resistor lug is. This is to prevent it bending down and shorting to the housing. Now you may also be wondering why there's only one wire connected between the socket and the resistor. Well, this is because the other connection or the outer connection actually uses the housing. The metal part of the resistor forms the connection to the output of the panel socket through the aluminium box. Now a quick check with the multimeter to check that we're still getting a 50 ohm match at the socket, and yep, 49.6 ohms seems to be close enough. Now the heat sink that I'll attach is a stick on heat sink. Now these work great and I've used them on many projects before, also quite easily to remove if you need to. Okay, so let's test it connected to an SWR meter with a radio set to 145.5 megahertz. Now that seems okay to me, an SWR of 1.1 seems quite reasonable. Holding the TX button in for a good 30 to 60 second, and it's holding its own. Not much fluctuation in the readings. Also, the aluminum box is quite cool still. 
Okay, so let's try this 70 centimeter band on 435 megahertz. Well, that's not good at all. We're now seeing an SWR of two, and that's at 435 megahertz, and an even higher SWR at 446 megahertz. So what's going on? Now this does not fill me with confidence that these RF resistors are capable of high frequency. So let's check what it looks like connected to a calibrated vector network analyzer or VNA, which should give us a nice wide spectrum of the response from the resistor. So here I'm gonna do from one megahertz up to 2.5 gigahertz. Here we can see exactly where it's resonant or where 50 ohms is. In fact, on the VNA software, we can change to impedance so we can see exactly where a 50 ohm match is and at what frequency. So there's either something wrong with my build or there's something wrong with the resistor. Considering that there's actually not many parts involved in building this, I would say that there's something wrong with the resistor. So back to the drawing board, or should I say back to Amazon or eBay and try and find some other 50 ohm RF resistors with at least the 100 watts rating. If you guys know of any specific components which you think I should use, then please let me know down in the comments below. Until the next video, stay safe, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.